In this podcast, we discuss COVID-19 travel guidelines for people traveling between Ireland and the US this Christmas. In the first half of the show, we are joined by Sean O'Hay, the Deputy Consul General of Ireland in New York and top US immigration attorney, Larkin Shannon. Sean provides us with the Irish government's latest guidelines for travellers in terms of travel restrictions and COVID testing, and he discusses the services the consulate provides here. In the second half of the show, Johnny, myself and Larkin expand on the conversation, and Larkin provides us with some updates on US visas. We also chat about the state of the New York economy and the outlook for the hospitality industry as indoor dining verges on being shut down. The latest travel advice is up on the Irish Consulate's website or check out their Twitter handle at IrelandInNY while Lark and Shannon can be contacted for US visa inquiries via email on larkin at larkinshannonlaw.com. Please like and subscribe to the podcast. This will ensure that we can get more podcasts to you more often. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter at The Long Haul Podcast. We started off the show by asking Sean about his background and the role of the consulate here in New York. So I'm, uh, we have two deputies at the, at the consulate. Um, so me and my colleague Emer, um, and I cover all things comms, really press, media, um, but the whole range of things as well. And in normal times, we'd be doing a lot of events. Uh, we'd be out and about, obviously different times at the moment. Um, okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I'm from Dublin, um, originally from Sandy Mount, um, and I've been in New York just over two years. Um, and before I was at the consulate here, I spent about seven years working on humanitarian aid. So that was really what I was working on. I was two years in Ethiopia uh, with Irish aid there. Then I was in Geneva actually working as our kind of Ireland's interface with the WHO and with the Red Cross and humanitarian agencies there. And then I was back working for Irish Aid on humanitarian issues as the deputy director. Um, So pretty different to my role in New York, uh, but uh, it's all good in in our business. uh, You have to change change jobs uh, regularly. You have to be adaptable. So and it's great to be in New York in normal times, obviously. Yeah, so you, you've gotten around anyway. That's an impressive resume. Fair play. Yeah, I mean, it's very, it was very rewarding for sure working in, in somewhere like Ethiopia. But uh, that's the nature of the game. You, you have to move around the world. Um, and normally, it's, yeah, it's, it's a great job to be in, but you have to be willing to change right. and pick up new skills. What kind of experiences did you draw, draw from them, Sean? Obviously, like, you're in th- those tough countries or like, economically tough. Did you, what, did, what kind of experiences did you draw from those jobs? Um, I suppose... Um, you know, you have to be mindful of, there's different ways of doing things. So Ethiopia, it's a very different culture. Uh, everything is different. They have a different way of telling the time. They have, a diff- they have 13 months in the year. It's not the year 2020, it's the year 2007. Um, so you get to, you know, realize that there is more than one way of looking at things. Um, and I think that's kind of useful that you realize the way that we do things in Ireland or the way that we do things in the West there's lots of other ways of doing things. So okay. I think that's, yeah, that's so, something. So Cork and Kerry are still good at football <laughs> yeah. in Ethiopia. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> and do they drink it in thing. Ethiopia? <laughs> they do. They do, actually. They love it. Yeah. It's, and it's very big in West Africa, as you probably know, in Nigeria. Yeah. They're, they're very big into Guinness as well. <laughs> We're dying, to get a, we're dying to get a Guinness in the long haul lately, but uh, ho- hopefully in a couple of months all, all will calm down. Yes, hopefully, yeah. So Sean, do you mind telling us, um, just give us an outline on the, what the consulate does uh, here in New York and uh, do you know what services it provides for Irish people here, just give yeah, us a good background. Absolutely. So obviously the embassy is in DC, so they're dealing with the White House, they're dealing with Congress, the Senate, trying to get, uh, you know, Ireland's goals progress there through the political system on things like immigration reform, things like that. And we in the consulate, we're promoting all aspects of Irishness here in the, in the states that we cover. So we cover as well as New York, we have New Jersey, we have West Virginia, we have Connecticut, um, and we have Delaware. And we're promoting Irish culture, we're promoting Irish business. Um, and then, of course, we, we have our messaging that we're putting out about, you know, things like Brexit, things like Northern Ireland, where the U.S. has been so important and so influential in the past. And we are trying to remind Irish Americans and American politicians of the importance of Ireland, of the importance of Northern Ireland. And then 
for Irish citizens, of course, we're here to provide a range of services. So we're helping people get their passports renewed. Um, we're helping people that have come into any sorts of difficulties and, you know, who might be arrested and um, who might be sick and um, who might have fallen out of contact uh, with relatives at home. So anything like that, we're there for them. Um, and normally in pre-COVID times, we'd have a lot of events. We'd have two events, I think, at least a week in the consulate on Park Avenue. Um, and of course, that's all changed since COVID. So a lot quieter. Um, but we're still, we've been, we were, we're in, in person every second day. We're on two teams. Um, and the only time we were closed where we didn't have people in was about six weeks from mid-April to the end of May, kind of the hardest times in, in New York. Um, but since then, we've been, yeah, we've been working away and uh, still processing passports and uh, visas and, and, and all of that. Yeah, has there been, there's been naturally a bit of a backlog there, Sean, has there over the last couple of months? Yeah, so when Ireland was in level five, um, so the last sort of six weeks, um, they weren't processing passports in, in Ireland. So we were still doing what we could do. We do some sort of preliminary checks and all of that. And then, um, but things were then kind of stuck, but they've, they're back working again since last week. So things have begun to move. So I saw we got a huge parcel today of, 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 di of passports in the diplomatic bag. So they were going to be busy sending out tomorrow. Um, awesome. So we'll, we'll, we'll cut to the chase. So Sean, so of, of course, um, with, with COVID, uh, there's, there's guidelines and uh, restrictions on what people can and cannot do coming up to Christmas time. So what's the, the official line uh, f from the Irish government? And of course, um, the, the travel ban is technically still in place, isn't it, since March? Yeah, from the US side. So I suppose I'll talk from, about the Irish side maybe okay. to begin with. So, you know, our overall travel advice is to avoid all non-essential travel. That's both people moving out of Ireland and coming into Ireland. So um, that has remained in place uh, since the start of March. Um, and basically what we're trying to do that with that is to keep people in Ireland as safe as possible and as, and as well as possible. Um, and obviously the US, that's been the, the advice from the US as well um, to avoid non-essential travel, most places in the world, including Ireland at the moment. And we saw a lot of all that messaging from the CDC around Thanksgiving that it's, it's safer to stay at home um, if you can. Um, you know, my mother is 81. She's a widow. She's by herself. I'd love to, normally I'd go home about three times a year. I'd love to be home at Christmas. She'd love to have me home as well. But we decided, you know, the safest thing this year is for me to stay here. So I've been, you know, I've been here since in, since last January. Um, and the, the aim, I suppose, is just to reduce the spread of the virus at home. And we've been quite successful with that. You've probably seen, you know, after the six weeks of level five, we had one of the lowest uh, case numbers in Europe. When you look at the map of Europe, they have us and Finland and Iceland and Norway, I think, as, as orange and all the rest of them, all the rest of the countries red. So we've been quite successful in that. And what we're trying to do is, is protect those uh, gains that we've made, protect that progress that we've made through that kind of six hard weeks that we've had mm. in Ireland, pretty, pretty strict restrictions. Um, and I guess New York here, you know, I think we've all probably, if we're living in New York, we've all, we all know how serious to take the virus. We've all, I mean, I, I know people who, you know, who died, I'm sure you do as well, people who were very sick from it. Um, and we know that we need to just continue for a few more months to be, to be, very, to be very careful um, uh, in, in how, we, uh, how we act and, and in reducing our interactions with others. Um, I can go on. I mean, if people do feel they need to travel, then I can go into the restrictions on that, if that's... If yeah, I think that would be the... Yeah, I think that would be the next thing to do because uh, I think there is a lot of people who have made that decision they're going to go home. So what's the advice for people and what are the precautions they should take? Yeah, um, and I suppose just to say, you know, we advise against non-essential travel, but everyone has to make that decision for themselves. Families, uh, individuals, they have different circumstances and we're not here to kind of assess or judge whether something's essential or not. And we've had, you know, people calling into us asking about various scenarios it's kind, of, it's kind of for people to assess themselves. We know people have all sorts of maybe caring responsibilities and elderly, 
parents and they need to go home to give some respite to one parent who's caring for the other parent, things like that. So what we're just asking is if you've made the decision to go home, if you think that it's important, necessary that you go home at the moment, these are the guidance that you follow when you go. So if you're coming from somewhere like the US, which we would deem kind of high risk, a, a, red, a red zone country, you follow the usual precautions when you're traveling, you know, washing your hands, having your mask on, trying to be as careful as possible when you're traveling uh, through the airport on the plane and then home to Ireland. Then you restrict your movements for five days. Uh, that means basically staying at home. You can go out for exercise. You can go to the shops if necessary. But basically, you're trying to reduce your interactions as much as possible. So if you have family who can drop you groceries or you can do your ordering online, all the better. Um, on day five, you take a COVID test. Um, now, not a, not a rapid test, but I think it's called... A, is it called a, a PCR test? I have the, the wording there. A PCR COVID test after five days. And then if you get that back and hopefully it's negative, then you can act as you would if you were living in Ireland. And of course, those same restrict. there's many restrictions remaining on people in Ireland. You know, for the moment, you're not allowed, to, you're not supposed to leave the county that you're living in. So traveling from US to Ireland, after you receive that negative result, you're bound by the same rules as anyone else in Ireland. So that's it, really. Okay, and you can't get a, a rapid test when you land, can you? I don't, I'm not even sure if they're available in Ireland, are they? But you, um, you have to wait the five days before you can get a test, can you? Or could you? Have could you... To wait. Yeah, no, you, you need to wait five days in case you're incubating the virus. Okay. Uh, then on day five or afterwards, you get your PCR test. Um, and there's, I think, on Dublin Airport a website and Cork Airport website, they've list of providers who provide those tests. Um, and then uh, hopefully you'll be negative and then you can go about your business then after you have your negative results. Um, okay. Well, sorry, Michael, I shot just so... The, 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 the tests that are set up in the airport and the outside airport, they're not really much advantage to anybody then, are they, if we have to test again after five days? Test, I mean, so there's different rules for coming into the US. So I suppose the test... I'm talking about if you're flying into Dublin, say, from New York. So if someone's yeah. leaving from New York or Boston or whatever in the next week or something or this week, mm -hmm. they have these tests set up in Dublin Airport and the, the two hotels outside, I think, the Radisson and someone else has it. But you... You, you actually need to test five days later again, don't you? So is there any point in doing the one when you land? As you say, go, isolate yourself for five days as best you can, and then come back and get the five, after the five days. Because there is some people confusion. You hear people, I don't know if they're saying features of benefit, oh, I'm going to get tested before I leave, which is a good thing to do. I'm going to get tested when I land again. That's just a waste of 200 euros, because you're going to have to get tested after five days. Well, I suppose being tested before you fly, no, that's a good thing. Is, right? is, is it a good Dublin idea? Airport. Because yeah. yeah, I suppose in Dublin Airport, I think they're geared more for people before they fly because there are, for okay. example, the US, if you're traveling into the US, the okay. US, like New York State, for example, recommends that you get tested before you fly and then get tested after you arrive. But I suppose coming from the US to Ireland, what we'd recommend is, you know, you leave the airport, hopefully someone can pick you up or you're renting a car you isolate yourself and then you go get tested somewhere in your in your community your, yeah. uh, wherever you can so ireland doesn't actually have you know when you hear people saying oh you're going to quarantine we don't actually have a 14-day quarantine it's like restrict your movements mm -hmm. and then as you say if you get it with it after five days and then you're good to go you as you say act then like you're supposed to act at home like yeah i mental. mean I mean, until the end of November, we had a regime in place where you're supposed to restrict your movements for 14 days. And now since the start of December, it's kind of been adapted a little bit in, a, in, in line with EU regulations where you do this test after five days. And then if it's negative, hopefully, then you, you go about your business. Um, okay. And is, so on the, the flip side of that, so then, Sean, there's um, exemptions about coming into the US. Now, you, you don't specifically deal with that at the consulate, but there is people who are applying for exemptions to, to fly back in if they're on a visa. Yeah, so, and I know Lorcan's going to be able to maybe talk about this as well. So what we would say to people is to check with the US authorities. Of course, you have to get it really from the horse's mouth, the information on that. Okay. So people will know about the proclamation, um, presidential proclamation in March, which basically said 
anyone who isn't a cit a u.s citizen or a u.s permanent resident or a family member and has been in ireland or one of a number of other eu countries for 14 days before they travel they, they can't do it basically now they have a number of exceptions and there's quite a useful kind of q a on the u.s uh, embassy website the, their their dublin embassy um, and what would recommend people who think that they may fall into one of those categories is to get in touch with them because they're the people who are going to have to make a decision on whether you're exempted or not um, and you don't want to rock up to dublin airport and then have uh, customs and border protection turning you away after a five-hour wait or whatever it is do you would you know more about on, on that side larkin about the, the exemptions i know you have a few uh, clients that have um, been on to you about it yeah, I guess there's a, a couple of things that everyone has to think about. Like Sean was saying, actually, the, the embassy websites are great right now. Every embassy, every U.S. embassy in each country has a, a different page where they talk about the exemptions and what you might be eligible for. I guess the first place to look is, are you just exempt from the ban because you're the spouse of a citizen, the spouse of a green card holder, the parent of a, a child that's under the a U.S. citizen child that's under the age of 21? So if you are one of those, you you can just travel pretty freely. Again, take a look or speak to an attorney, but you shouldn't have a huge amount of problems traveling into the U.S. Um, after that, there's the national interest exemptions that are available. This is what most people are trying to avail of right now, and it's, it's pretty tricky. Every embassy has a different uh, method of applying, but they're all somewhat similar. So what you typically have to do is you have to be in the country that you're applying in. So you have to go to Ireland without getting the exemption. So you're leaving not knowing whether you're going to get it or not, which is why we, we also advise against travel. But if you have to go, this is how you would try to get back. So when you get to Ireland within 30 days of when you plan to travel back to the US, you can apply for the exemption. They typically want to see a letter from your employer saying why you need to get back to the US. And that's the other big thing that people sometimes forget. Everyone's telling me a good reason why they need to go to Ireland, which is understandable. But what the embassy are concerned about is why you need to come back to the US. So they want to see that reason. They want to see your flights, a copy of your visa, a copy of your passport. And each embassy has some other requirements. Like in Dublin, for example, they want a letter confirming that you are in Ireland and when you got there, um, you send that to the embassy, they have a special email address set up and I have to commend them on this. You know, they are very responsive on these things. All the embassies I've dealt with have been very responsive. If you send in an application, if they need any more information, they tend to get back pretty quickly. They usually approve or deny within five days. Um, so you'd have to put that all together and it's not a huge amount of information send it to them as a pdf and they, they'll come back to you within five days to say you're exempt uh, sometimes they give a blanket exemption for the next 30 days you're, you're good to enter the us sometimes they ask for the specific flight details and you're literally just exempt for that flight um, so you have to get there early to the airport when you are traveling and present the email where they said you're exempt sometimes the airlines you know, when you try to check in, they see you have an E visa or an O visa and they know those are banned. So their immediate reaction is you're not eligible. So you want to get there early and the embassy advice that you get there early, bring all the documentation so you can convince the airline that you're eligible to enter. And I guess the other option then for some people, if they travel, then don't get the exemption. The kind of final option is to go to a country that's not on the banned list for 15 days. Um, so if, if you've been in Ireland or the Schengen zone, uh, Brazil, um, China or Iran in the last 15 days, you can't enter the US. So, but if you go to Mexico, Canada for 15 days, a lot of our clients have gone to uh, the UAE, Croatia, Turkey, and with that too, I say 15 days, but maybe do 16, people are like, trying to do 15 days and they're including the day they landed and we've had some people get to the airport and they say well we're counting from the next day so just take the extra day to be safe you know um but on that if you have a valid visa and you've been in croatia or wherever it may be for 15 days you will be allowed to enter the us or typically you know you can't guarantee but you're no longer subject to the travel ban so that's kind of the if all else fails option for people who are going home if they can't get the exemption that's the plan b 
Okay, and what did you say there was a waiting time for uh, when you get a word back on an exemption when, when you arrive in Ireland, uh, Larkin, how long could you be waiting? Usually about five days. They've okay. been pretty quick. They, um, but you can apply until you're within 30 days of your flight. So if you were at home now and you're planning to, they, you'd have to be flying on or before January 7th, I guess, um, if you're going to apply. But yeah, they've been fairly quick on the turnaround. Okay. So it's a long stay, basically, if you're going to be if you're going to take that risk of going home. Yeah, and I think some people are going home, maybe thinking things might change. You know, new president coming in. One thing I'm always reminding people is the earliest he's coming in is January twentieth or twenty first. So you're going to be home for a long time after Christmas if you're hoping the rules are going to change, and they might change very quickly even after he gets in. That especially applies to some people who are going home without having a visa like michael you know the process you apply to uscis here your petition gets approved then you go to the embassy and they issue the visa in that case if someone hasn't they have the approved petition but don't have the visa we would strongly recommend not traveling because first of all you have to get an appointment at the embassy to get the visa you have to be approved Mm -hmm. then you have to get the exemption it's just a lot of variables in that situation at least if you have the visa you don't get the exemption you go to Croatia or Canada for two weeks and you know you'll get back in at that point you know yeah that situation would not be worth the risk at all in my opinion if you're uh, you know you don't want to give like as people know who've gone through the airports you know or whatever you know you don't you don't want to give them any 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 inkling or any chance to to deny you getting on that flight like so if if you're in that situation definitely try and avoid it yeah the thing to to remember is if you look on the embassy's websites and they do have really good information at the moment but a lot of them say they've been open since july 21st but when they opened in july slash august they were just letting in or prioritizing appointments for like spouses of citizens and doctors then and students who had to start school in september so there wasn't that many appointments available for people with you know your typical visas like h o l visas and then when they did get around to issuing them they had to close again pretty quickly because we went back into lockdown so you know you might see that you go home with the hope of getting an embassy appointment then they close again in mid-january and you're stuck at home for another five weeks so i think going home with a visa hoping to get the exemption is one thing but if you don't have a visa and you're hoping to get an appointment at an embassy it's, it's definitely very risky what's the advice then when you land larkin um is is there a quarantine or sean you might know is there is there another way to get a test when you land here again or what's the procedure johnny there is i think johnny you're going home and you are a citizen so i wasn't just wondering if you've what guidelines you'd have to follow uh, and i, I suppose... think it's just what sean said there is it you could do, they expect you to do it in dublin yeah. is it before we come back again and then quarantine when we get back yeah i suppose it might change again so you'd need to look at it's it's state by state so you might need to look at the new york state uh, advice but we were in contact with them last week just to check what the what the deal is for people coming from ireland and uh it was obtain a test within three days of departure uh prior to arriving new york then when you're in new york you quarantine for three days and on day four you get a test and then if both tests are negative, you're able to exit quarantine then once you, once you have the second one. So, I mean, I don't know. We've seen Cuomo, Governor Cuomo say things might change next week. So people would need to, you know, keep an eye on, on the New York State uh, uh, health website for that. Okay. The advice is to just keep checking continuously, isn't it? And uh, you're on Twitter there, Sean. It's uh, Ireland in, uh, at Ireland in NY, isn't it? The Twitter Ireland handle for the Irish. NY, yeah, and our website is pretty, hopefully pretty easy. It's uh, www.dfa.ie forward slash New York. Okay, perfect. So, Sean, you were just going to give us um, an update on some of the events that might be coming up there with the consulate in the coming weeks. Of course, the, the first... First Friday of every month, the breakfast there for someone. Uh, I'm like yourself. I've been in New York with just over two years, and the first couple of Fridays, couple of Fridays, I used to go to all those uh, th- those get-togethers, and they were a great way of um, networking with people here. And of course, um, COVID has uh, put that uh, has said that virtual. But you've been you've been uh, plowing on with them, haven't you? They've they've been going on virtually. Yeah, we've been doing them virtually. Obviously, it's not the same. You've no yeah, tea. Yeah. You've no sausages. Um, <laughs> but we've been trying to keep going with them, um, and we have, and I've, we'll have one. The next one will be in january the not the first friday because that's new year's day and we don't want to get people up at uh, 7 a.m on new year's day but it'd be on the 8th of january and we'll be featuring um the 
directors of the um, Origin First Theatre Festival, which happens every year in January. Um, so we'll have Meet Malamfi and, and Sarah Street from that. Um, and I suppose coming up to Christmas, there's, you know, we're so lucky in New York, there's so many great Irish uh, organisations here. Um, and I know the New York Irish Centre is having a performance of their choir, a uh, holiday celebration on the 17th of December, and the Irish Repertory Theatre has a, an online show going on, Meet Me in St. Louis, which got a write-up in the New York Times, I think, earlier this week, so um, doing well. Um, and the last thing maybe I just wanted to mention, it's, uh, you know, everything's virtual at the moment, um, but the Department of Foreign Affairs has launched um, a website, which is to be irish.ie um, and people there's a whole program of kind of online events that are happening all around the world and it's trying to kind of connect people who can't travel home at this okay. christmas so you know and you can upload maybe if you have a memory of being a special memory of an irish christmas at home you can upload that but there's also kind of a program of loads of virtual events it's not the same but I, as good as we're going to get this christmas i think yeah, hopefully, hopefully in a couple of months we'll uh, round the corner, as someone said there recently. So, uh, <laughs> so ho- hopefully we'll back. Corner. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully we'll see the the, the things uh, to improve in the, after Christmas, and we'll be back in the yeah. in the consulate for the the tea yeah, and the sausages. sausages. Yeah, hopefully. Okay. But listen, I just wanted to say thanks a million for having me. On. No problem. The consulate is is here. If people need us, please stay Thank safe, you, stay healthy. But do reach out to us uh, and we have lot, lots of info on our website, which we keep updated, uh, dfa.ie forward slash New York. But give us a call, send us a message. Uh, we might not, staff might be working at home, but they're picking up the messages and, and I'll be, they'll get back to you. Um, and we're here for people if, if they need, if they have questions. Absolutely. Thanks a million, Sean. Appreciate your time. Thank no you. No worries at all. Bye-bye. Thanks. What, what would you advise people coming at the airports again, Larkin, just to, you know, have your paperwork and having you know yeah uh with that i guess just to get there early is key even if you have the exemption like people we've had who have the exemptions or who are you know married to a citizen like i was saying earlier the airlines are pretty cagey because if if you enter the us and you're told you're not allowed to be here like if they stop you in jfk the airline get fined and it's pretty hefty fine like a couple of grand so they're very nervous i'm sure Whoever lets you on might get fired or something, you know. So their immediate response is, you're not eligible to travel. So just getting there early is important. So you can say, like, everyone we've had got an exemption, had had to go through this where they were told they weren't eligible to travel at the at the check-in desk. And they said, no, I am. I have an exemption. Please check. And they have a physical list of who's got the exemption at the airport. So just little things like that are helpful. Um I guess just checking the embassy websites regularly. They are actually really good with information at the moment. Um, they have like a Q&A section. And then other than that, yeah, to just touch base with an attorney before you travel. I was saying to you on the phone yesterday, I'm surprised by how many people contact me now not realizing they are subject to a ban. You know, I thought at this point everyone knew it, but I think sometimes people think, well, that doesn't apply to people with visas. It applies to almost everyone, bar citizens or relative of citizens. Um, so that's important to note. And yeah. one other thing, just to finish off there, I see in my notes here, there are multiple travel, multiple bans, uh, proclamations that came into place in the last six months. So one relating to issuance of H-1B is, expires on December 31st. But the people who were subject to that, that means they can potentially get a H-1B in their passport on January 2nd, but they're still subject to the other travel ban that bans travel from Ireland. So that doesn't have an expiration date. So just to be aware that people Google this and they see, oh, ban expires on December 31st, but there's multiple bans in play is the problem. Okay. Well, yeah, it's, um, there's a lot, of, a lot of wrinkles to it, isn't there? There's a lot of complexities. Yeah, it's the last eight months or long it's been at this point have been pretty crazy just with all these bans and all these changes and there's been changes and then they get changed back to the old way and then they change again. So there's been a lot going on. Yeah, and you, you think saying- most people or sorry, Michael, do you think most people are like a lot of lads I know that are on them visas now are not a lot, but they've all just decided not to go. Is there yeah. a lot of people going still on the flip side? I'm kind of surprised. Like it's been, everyone was not going. And then the last yeah. two weeks now we've gotten 
so many requests for these travel exemptions and yeah. so many applications in motion now like the last two weeks have been as busy as we've been for the last several months so i think is, just as, is that because of the irish government's decision to open up a little maybe yeah and you probably see it too johnny though every year you know yeah. no, no one's go, well not no one's going home but a lot of people aren't going and then they are going you know um, well the big reason for it this time i think well of them obvious reasons but other years that you wouldn't see it as much because the flights are still the regular price now there's you can still fly for a reasonable price like you know yourself on any given year lads you didn't even have to live here you could guess if you hadn't your flight booked in june yeah you were paying over a thousand dollars a flight now you can still fly for 600 like and i think just to hit on there what uh, sean said about como's words and saying if the service industry closes completely now a lot of people are out of work anyway majority of us are but as you know michael with fence and the lads and haswells and lot and lot, there's still a lot of bars still open if he closes that this what did he say five days yesterday that seems to be an indication there's five days get rid of all your products get rid of everything we're going to shut it down i'd fear then that a lot more people will go then if they anticipate new york being shut down and then they hear new orleans going to be open which is not exactly full throttle ahead that a lot more people might actually go yeah and a lot of our clients too have visas you know you'd hope if they're coming to us to have visas after it and they they're willing to go because they've been working remotely anyway so even if they don't get the exemption i think they're not that put off by the idea of two weeks wherever it may be croatia or mexico yeah. or barbados whatever they work the same as they have been it's just the first two weeks in january spent in that place so that is a, a helpful plan b for a lot of people i think yeah it doesn't sound too bad as you say if it's in mexico and again if you are already working remotely they probably already do that i find that the few people that i do know and stuff like they've already gone they've gone within the last week they're gone already and that's probably a smart thing to do i think some of them have just assumed they have to quarantine for two weeks i was talking to someone the other day and they they went home fully expecting to quarantine for two weeks and it was literally only when they were on the plane that they realized what I said earlier on, that they're going to have to test five days later. So they just scrapped the idea of testing when they landed, went straight home, and they actually have been locked down now for the last, I think, just over a week. So they're going to get tested this week, and then they're good to go. That's it. I think a lot of people are doing it that way. Yeah, a lot. And if, they're, if, you're in, like, if you were on a visa and you were out of work for a, a period of time over the last couple of months, are you running a big risk then as well? Of go, like if you're on a H-1B and you were out of work for a couple yeah. of months and then you're, going, you're, you're, you're back on work and you're going home, like, is it, like obviously you said that the advice is to stay here, but if you just, like, what are the, I suppose, what are the, the extra risks then in that situation? Yeah, that is a big concern. Like generally, you shouldn't be out of work for more than 60 days at a time on most visas. That's the grace period at the end of the visa. And it doesn't sound like long, but it actually used to be 10 days and they increased it to 60 a couple of years ago. So you have after if you're let go from your job, you have 60 days to you know, find something else or change status or leave the country. And one concern I do have is that maybe some people were out of work for more than 60 days, then went back to work and just thought, I'll just ignore that. I could see immigration, whether it be USCIS here or Border Patrol, asking specifically about those months. You know, if you get a, an officer who wants to do some digging, they might think a lot of people are out of work from March yeah. to August. That could be something they look at. And, you, you know, they they pick up on patterns and they see things like that. So if they catch a few people then they might see everyone. So that is something to be concerned about. I would say if you were out of work, speak to a lawyer and we can see what options you have. And would you recommend going like, I, I know with the restrictions or whatever, but would you recommend a, a certain route to go into Ireland that would be kind of um, a bit safer? Would you go fly uh, directly into the country or is it? Well, go, going back to Ireland is, is fine. I mean, it, it generally don't you don't encounter immigration leaving the country the only times i ever heard about this and johnny you might not or have heard about this too is like at stewart i heard that immigration were stopping people leaving i guess because it's so correct small. yeah they used to go onto the they used to go onto the plane yeah that was very strange it's very weird i don't and I, I don't understand the reason for it but as you say maybe small they were just not necessarily looking at irish people as such but just checking out another stuff i was at stewart once i dropped somebody off at it and i said I'd say they were just bored. <laughs> what yeah. else to do? That Let's just go my... on and have a chat to a few people here. That might be, you know, it is interesting, that, but I don't know. That was my take on it too, that potentially just they didn't have a huge amount to do. Yeah. And the other thing I think they, they probably realize that a lot of people are 
very on edge when they're entering the country, but not so much when they're leaving. So it might have been a good yeah. time to question people, and they mightn't, you know, be as prepared. Um, with regard to coming back, I, it's very hard now traveling back. I mean, it's hard to recommend any one place over the other. They're all pretty strict at the moment, you know. Yeah. Um, even places where we're traditionally more friendly pretty strict right now it's because they're just everyone's on edge i guess from the airline to border patrol it's all pretty tricky right now are they being tough more so, so you're saying they're being strict at the moment is that just totally covid like you know what i mean like christmas notoriously like back 10 15 years ago when everyone used to be taking a chance everyone say don't go christmas you're stupid they'll get you at christmas lads would wait longer into january so is it more of a covid issue now or at the moment or yeah are they, I often wonder on the human aspect is what I really mean, Larkin. I often found these lads in Dublin just kind of a little bit browned off with these different visas coming in. You have that visa, you have that and they were nearly like it was the look of the draw. If you got the wrong fella, like is it nearly still the same? Is it the human error aspect always going to be part of it? Yeah, there definitely is an element of the officer you meet on the day can be some are more difficult than others, you know. But I do think they're more on edge right now. You know what they were right. maybe willing to overlook in the past. Um, I find they're not willing to overlook right now because they, they have so many reasons to stop people as opposed to letting them in right now, you know? Yeah. But yeah, definitely stricter. Even, you know, I don't really want to name airports specifically, but ones we've always found fine and, uh, you know, that you would have dealt with and found fine. They, yeah. I've found them stricter in the last couple of months for sure. Even don't the worry, last I'll couple of whichever, months. I'll no. guess whichever one it was because I'm sure I tried to go through it at some stage in my life, Michael, you know what I mean? <laughs> list out the easy ones there I know it's 12 o'clock at night great job that is yeah that's interesting Larkin have you uh, can you give us some update on the, the H1Bs for next year you were saying that there might be a better chance for people to get H1Bs next year of course and it might be harder than to get a job at the same time next year yeah. but you're saying that uh, the lottery might um, might not exist next year might not meet that threshold of uh, yeah. people applying I mean that's just guesswork on my part but one thing I do like you find in the media, like they, there's a ban on H1Bs according to the media right now, but really that's just a ban on issuance of people who are already approved and expires on the December 31st. So the lottery the, or the application process will happen next year. And the reason I think there'll be a lot less is just really based on 2008, 2009, after the last recession, the numbers dropped from pretty much 300,000 applications in a week to about 5,000 in the first week. And like when I got my H1B, I remember 2010, 2011, you just had to apply and you got it. And most people around my age would say the same thing. You applied and you got it. It was not an issue. And then from 2013 onwards, there was a lottery due to numbers and it's been increasing year on year. But I would say at the very least, there'll be a huge dip in the number of applications. So there will be better odds for sure of getting picked. Um, I can't say for certain it won't be a lottery, but I think if there is a lottery, it won't be a one in three chance. It'll probably be more like a 50-50 or something. Okay. And has there been any other changes to visas in the last couple of months since we since we touched base? Um, since then, just the embassies reopened and then they closed again. There's been some things relating to green card. It's probably too in-depth to get into. And it's okay. one of the things that's flipped, but they have what's called a prevailing wage and they increased it dramatically. Like some jobs went from... 50 to 80,000 as the minimum. Like your cost estimator, for example, would have been 50,000 typically for the last 10 years was the, the minimum they had to be getting paid and that jumped to 80, but that actually got struck down. So that's now going to go back to 50. So there's been a lot of that where things are changing and then changing back. Um, they introduced a, a, a guideline to make sure that people wouldn't become public charge when they file for a green card and that got struck down then it got reintroduced and it's kind of in limbo again. So just things like that, a lot changing all the time, really. Okay. And in wait time, in wait time, Larkin, for anyone, um, people that are waiting for interviews and people are waiting for 10-year yeah. visas from the from the short one. Is that any longer, any shorter at the moment? Obviously, a lot of it's online and stuff. As regards yeah. the interviews, are they happening at the moment? Yeah, Anything the interviews, like that? interviews came back in i would say august or september and they're not actually as bad as you think the wait times um so the the 10 year green card like after you've had your conditional permanent residence for two years and you apply to yeah. a new condition that was getting longer and longer to the point that it was, yeah. of, 
Yeah, they, they used to extend you for a year after you file and they changed that to 18 months. It's actually getting shorter now, though. Like I used to tell people approximately 10 to 12 months it take to process. And now it's come back to about eight months at the moment. So some things did get quicker in the pandemic. The interviews are hard to say because they were shut down for so long. We don't really know. But one positive again that's come from this is they seem to be um, bypassing interviews for employment-based green cards. So that's good. Yeah, a long right. wait in the employment-based green card process was just waiting for an interview at the end, and they're not doing the interviews. So some people are kind of getting shafted in it in that they waited for an interview. It got scheduled in March, then it got cancelled, then they eventually got their green card. But people who are filing now are going to get the benefit of that, that the process should be a good bit quicker. So these are people that were sponsored mm-hmm. through their work? And then they're applying for the green card through, okay, some of them were waiting for the interview, but now it's the usual with immigration. It's like they've gone back to the start with the fresh guy that's come in. The guys that were waiting for the interview were waiting for a new redate and they've just been left in limbo. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what happened. Like, for example, (laughs) when you file an application, you get called for biometrics. So we had a lot of people who filed between March and August when the offices were closed they're still waiting for appointments and people we filed two weeks ago are getting appointments. So yeah, there's, that happens pretty consistently where there's a certain tranche of people that are just yeah. stuck in limbo or in a different track. Some of them people will have to redo their biometrics if it goes over a certain period, won't they? If they had done biometrics and are waiting for the interview in between, they'll have to redo their biometrics. They've actually, in most cases now, they can do them at the interview. That's one thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was, it, I was amazed that they didn't do this before. They only introduced it about maybe three years ago that they actually take the biometrics at the interview. And I used to joke with the officer, now you actually know that the correct person is here because otherwise yeah, yeah, there yeah, yeah. anyone sitting there, you know. So what way do you see yourself, Larkin, just on your end? I know you're saying there's no application for visas now, but even when you're talking to people, do you see a mass exit? Have you seen... Like you were saying there with lads with visas and different things, stuff like that. Like if your fella's there in a long time and he's coming through his visa and all, and now he gets these restrictions and he hears this, even on a mental aspect, is this? A, do you see this on a, your personal answer? Like is, do you just see this as the, a step too far for some people where they're just, you know what, I'm done now. Enough's enough. Yeah, I feel like the people we deal with, like the lads you probably know, are here long enough yeah. and they're kind of, like we've been fairly busy throughout the year because we have a lot of clients who are far enough along with their company that they're not just going to pull the plug in their green card. They're too important to the business. Yeah, um, yeah. But I would say what you'd see a lot of people in that situation is like J1ers who are just like already thought it was impossible to stay here and now just assume it's yeah. completely impossible where it isn't that hard, but it is certainly yeah. more difficult. They can't go home and you know all the different issues we have now. I didn't, I didn't see a huge exodus from our clients. So really, I, I would say you probably saw more of people, you know, working in bars, they all closed. Mm. So people thought, all right, let's go home. Um, and maybe in construction as well. And I heard from some friends just anecdotally, like there was a lot who left. Because I saw that article in the Irish Central about people leaving. And I had thought, like, I think it was about Woodside not being as Irish anymore. And for me, it seemed still pretty Irish. But there, was, my friends were saying, yeah, a lot left in the last seven, eight months. Yeah, I would say that that's a bit, yeah, I would agree with you there. If anything, Woodside had kind of came back a bit more Irish in the last few years. And if anything, I wouldn't, I wouldn't totally 100% agree with that. And so as regards their service, the service industry, I think it might be, me and Michael might have been talking about this on it before. For some reason, we'd all come up with this imaginary thing that it was going to open in September. And I said, a lot of people wait until the September. So there was an exit then. And then the fact that it just didn't really kick off again. And then it's coming to Christmas and it's will we, won't we. And there definitely is now. Like in the last few weeks now, I've seen a good few that are gone. But thankfully for a lot of them, they have their green cards. So it's not, they're not ruling out potentially coming back. But you used the comparison there of 08 and stuff like that. There was never anything like this in 08 as regards people leaving for you know because of that certainly not an air industry anyway and even i know there was a crash and stuff but for the majority of young irish people they were in construction on either end of it whether it be outdoors or indoors and then people in the service industry whereas this has kind of rocked a lot of them but as you say a lot of your clients who i would know and stuff like that they're kind of just that little bit older they've got the extra amount of years similar to yourself they probably got here around 2010 11 12 
this is home to them now. They've invested into it. And it is tough for them. As much as I've been slagging a few of them in the last few days, this kind of was the norm that no one ever went home for Christmas. You know, but for them, I think I said this before, Michael, with you on here, until I seen it in the long haul, it was the first time I ever started feeling homesick because I started seeing all these lads going home for Christmas. I never knew loads of people who went for it because we we're all in the service industry. We could have been working up to Christmas Eve. So it definitely is tough for a lot of them. Because, and I might have been dismissive of it in the past. It's the milestone in the year, isn't it? You know, we'll get through to Christmas and get home and stuff like that. My parents are pretty easy going about it. But there's some people, like as Sean said there earlier on, for his mother, that's a big deal. Like, you know, for his mum at his or her age now, for him not to be able to come home. And that is tough. Like, I feel for people like that. And honestly, lads, let's be honest, especially for females. Like, it is really, really tough there, more so for females here, not being able to go home to mothers and stuff for Christmas. That is hard. And do you think uh, Como shutting down the bars will close a lot of places, you know, or head places, you know, have the ones that stuck it out, will they stick it out a bit longer? Or what do you think this is going to bring? I just think this is, lads, it's, there's no right and wrong answer. And I was in the bank today just chatting to the guy that I've been dealing with as regards to Westbury. And, like, I think we covered this before, like, Lads are blaming landlords. You see on Facebook, people writing up at a bar and they call landlords such and such, you know, he didn't do a deal with us. <laughs> who's doing a deal for the landlord? So who's doing a deal for this guy? So if a PPP loan or some sort of a bailout or some sort of a loan doesn't come, and then Michael, you know, you've heard me saying this numerous times, January and February is going to be very, very bleak for a lot of bar owners and me included. It's going to be very difficult. It's very hard now to sign on something now and they brought in that thing that went into, um, it's, it was passed in law last Monday, that any good guy clauses, you cannot be held accountable for them. So you can walk away. So if you have a guarantee, or a guarantee we all know, if you have a guarantee now, now you can walk away. So landlords are nervous now. So landlords might have been just keeping a tenant, at, you know, whether he was paying a little, paying nothing. Now the tenant's looking and going, 31st of December, I can walk away from this. And he could go back to the landlord in January, February, even, and say, "Well, you're going to let me back in." So this is, this is, this is going to be rough now. Or I do see a lot of bars closing, and then whether they come back into them or not, but they will have to walk away from them. So it'll, you will see it as it's gone, and it'll be up on a website that such and such a bar is gone. But the main reason be for that because the guy had an opportunity to get out of his clause. You don't want to be in it. Like we're, I know of bars without naming names, but like. I don't see the landlord winning in a case even without that law. But we all know what's it going to cost you to go through court for two or three years to find that out. And if you're standing there now in December, you still haven't opened. If he closes it now in four weeks' time, or sorry, four days' time, you're done for December. January and February is bad enough anyway, lads. And then you have an opportunity that the government is telling you, if you walk away now, he cannot go after you for anything. <laughs> How do they not give a loan then? So if they don't give a loan, and there ain't no PPP loan coming before Biden gets in, we all can accept that. And then, what? sorry, to the point the guy made in the bank to me today, the reason he sees there being a problem with the PPP loan, because the other one was just thrown out so quick. Like, they're not going to do that again and without looking into it. Like, he, to use his words, he's like, there was too much fraudulent activity done with PPP loans. Now, Anyone I know that's in the bars, they got them to try to stay in the business. So there's some bars that are going to close down now, lads. They got PPP loans and they activated it the day they were told to. They paid every staff member the way they were told to and they paid utilities. And they're getting no grace for it. And they're, they'll probably have to walk away. Like Mean Fiddler being an example in places like that. It is going to be difficult for them, you know. But like I say, who's done it for the landlord? But you could go on about it all night and no, there's no right or wrong answer. Did you get a, would you, did you get a loan even if you didn't reopen, Johnny? Yes. Basically, what it is, is you were given the loan and your intentions was to close down the bar. Sorry, it was to reopen the bar and bring all your staff back to work. Yeah. But if you have staff in there on, on the welfare and they're getting the dole, but then the city was closed. So see, they didn't match up, Michael. I think I remember saying to you before, New York shouldn't have been in the same equation. You were given a PP loan with the intention of you opening and bringing your staff back to work and doing stuff. That's why you've seen a lot of bars doing to go out the window and stuff like that. They weren't making any money out of that, but they were trying to do it to keep their staff in a, in a job. And they were doing it because they were told to do that. But if you got it then and you couldn't open, I think it was, what was it? I don't know the exact date, but let's say it was eight or nine weeks after you got it. You had to activate it on week 10, say. 
So if you weren't open, you had to activate it and start paying people that, that weren't working. And that's what we did. That's what we did with the long haul. We opened it, paid their kitchen staff, and paid them for the eight weeks. We had to use up the money. Otherwise, we were on the hook for it. So if we kept it, they okay. could come along next year and say, you owe X amount. And some people did roll that dice and keep it, and some didn't. And, but like that's where it, it's – a friend of mine said to me in the early days, it's literally going to be luck factor. Like there is some bars out there that would have got a lot more. It's based on your wage for over an eight-week period. So like there's reports, like certain bars could have got two and 300,000, but then they couldn't open. <laughs> so what was the – and then the ones that did open – used up all their PPP money during the summer months when there's nobody around. And now here they are, and they're in November, December, whatever. The money's gone because they did what they were told to do with it. And now they're bunched either way. You know, but if you had to give the money and told them, listen, just keep it till you open, which probably should have been the right thing to do. But I'm, def- I'm not knocking the government here or whatever they did. They were trying to do the right thing here. They were tr- and it was done very quick. And I think it was amazing what they did do. But like the law is only for the law abiding. Some people just probably took it. And then, you know, and then you also, oh, Michael, in their defense, then you have a landlord who's saying to you, but I want 100%. I want the full rent. And he's not giving you a break on it. <laughs> so what do you do? Like, I don't know. That's really too. How big would it be, Johnny, if things aren't open for like one of your big days is obviously Paddy's Day and that's not too far mm. away. And even if it, even if things do open, it's just no way that we're going to be at 100% indoor dining or indoor mm. gathering. So like, like how tough is that going to be even for Irish bars to get back up on their feet that they're going to probably miss two Paddy's Days in a row? Yeah. There's two ways of looking at it. And do you know what? We're that long into it now at this stage, whatever it is, nine months. Do you know what? And I think I could add talk for most of them here. The majority of them that are still there now and still surviving, they wouldn't care, Michael. They just want to be open. Mm. They just give them a chance and they would just be happy to survive. And I'm not knocking anyone else that's in bars and stuff like that, but it was always this thing for years, how construction lads were in bars and they'd get in with other lads and, you know, and stuff like that. But the construction guys are nervous now because their business could take a hit down the road. So they're probably trying to get away from the bars a little bit. So they're, so I can see that happening. But I'd say the majority of the Michael would have no problem. They don't, they're not that worried about it. They just want to be open because there is enough appetite out there. Like New York City is going young, lads. We can all see that. Like there's nobody coming back to that city that's a, a, like a family, you know, with young kids that would have been living Upper East Side, West Village. That ain't happening. I have spoke to a broker friend of mine and she told me she, she's apartments in the West Village now, three bedroom apartments for 3,000. They're often three months, they're often three months free up front and stuff like that same in parts of long island city and stuff like that and there's great value there but it's only young people that are going to take it but the other thing is michael not to like to confuse people too much when you go into every bar and like any bill in you go in you have like a your um public assembly and you've just stuff like that so you have your capacity about what you're allowed this is not a, like you know i'm not you know, like um i'm not giving away any secret here nobody ever goes by that number we all know that nobody's ever gone by that number so like I'll give you for instance, a long haul is only about 90 or something like that is my capacity. But if we're at 75%, if the governor comes out and says 75% and everyone's like, geez, that's great. In the defense of the fire department or whoever, the health department, whoever comes to inspect me, they will now look for that. Yeah. Whereas before they would have never looked for it. So I then have to, whether I like it or not, if unless it's 100%, he's not going to come in looking for that. So even yeah. if he come in and ask me, he's a hundred percent, that's still only eight or 90 people. I'd love to have that, but at 75%. So I'm now going to my landlord and I'm explaining that to him. And to be fair to him, he has been good, but that's the reality, Michael, as you say, Oh, we could be open in March. We all could be, when are we going to be a hundred percent? Like that is, that's the bigger question. And then you have other bar owners like the Macker who hopefully will become anomalous later this week or something. But you have bar owners like Macker and people like that that purposely went to get big places, obviously, for big numbers. Now, they can cater then for a certain number too, but it still puts them in the same position. Everyone says, oh, it's great to have a big place now. Big place, big money, big, <laughs> big rent, big everything else. And you're still, as I said before, all of our rents are based on New York, 4 a.m., fill the capacity a couple of times a week if you can and as you said to me michael big days all ireland hurlings you know football paddy's day mcgregor fights all these type of things you literally need them bumper days to get you through the quieter days you know so i i 
I'm even getting worried tomorrow to talk about it, you know, because I've been positive enough about it up to now. But it, this is going to be difficult. This is going to be very hard, you know. And I, I don't know. I really don't know. To answer the long way version of that, Larkin, I think it is going to be bad. And I think it because there's a lot of bar owners that it's, that's, it's not their sole business. It, they have other interests. And if they have, they have to look at whichever one. And right now, you wouldn't be looking at the bar industry when you'd be walking away from it. Yeah, and there's a feeling like the more you talk about it, that March is the new September. You know, we all just kind of picked March. But like Michael said, you'd probably be 50% at best in March. You're probably not even because they, they'll only yeah. have vaccinated certain people by then, you know. So, mm. yeah, it's going to be tough. But I, I, I want to just hit on that other thing again there, Michael. Is this thing that went in on Monday that's now in the Constitution that people can walk away by the end of the December now, landlords are still disputing that a little bit. And some landlords would think that they have, you know, they'd have good grounds. But I can tell from personal side, you can tell the way landlords are operating at the moment. They're kind of walking on eggshells. And there's an element in that. Are they trying to get you into January? And then when they get you into January, like you think about it, I'll just give you a hypothetical. Let's, let's say you're closed since March. Let's just say your landlord hasn't forgiven anything, but he's let it kind of build up. So we'll just say 20 grand for argument's sake. That's going up. You're up to two or three hundred thousand. If he hasn't agreed to forgive him that, and then there could be other concessions in there, like property tax, water. If 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 he piled all that together, potentially, you could be up to two or three hundred thousand or something. You have somebody standing in front of you and saying, "If you walk away by next Thursday or whatever day it is, he cannot go after you for that." But if you stay there till the following week, that stuff's all on the table. Like it's incentivizing it, you to walk away. Like is what you're saying. And it is, and that's horrible because every guy that's been in this and every guy is a similar story. You know, they have a love for their own place, the passion, especially, like I say, the guys that this is their only business. So if a PPP loan doesn't come, or even if there's no word of it, you now have 31st of December and a PPP loan that we're what, saying it's going to be the end of January. That's a big gamble. That is a massive gamble to take. If you have not sat down with a landlord and he has said to you, I'll forgive them months. And I'm not saying he should do this, by the way, because some people are saying he should. Like, well, who, who's going to forgive for him? But anyway, if he does, if he forgives you the month and gives you some concessions going forward and you see that, similar to what I said about the apartment, you think about it. If the three of us then, if we, I walked away from the long haul tomorrow, the three of us can go to him in January or February and say, well, how much do you want for it? And if the three of us did take over a new building tomorrow, what's common in the, that business is you ask for a six-month build-out. And he's going to have to give it to you. So again, I've probably said this before, and I'm like, you've got to go to him now and say, instead of giving it to the next guy, why can't we work at it now? But everyone has a different relationship with each landlord. And if there's any bad blood that has carried on, and then yeah. there is some lads that then went in, Michael, looking for too much very early on, like, you know, started looking for deals. And as Larkin said, March is like, March is the new September. There was lads in the middle of the summer doing great deals to get them to September. September comes and there's nothing and now they're still paying. I know of a couple of bars that are paying a good bit of money right now and they still can't see light at the end of the tunnel. So I don't know, lads. <laughs> it's gut wrenching. I was in uh, I was in Haswell's a couple of weeks ago, Johnny, talking to your brother mm. in there and um great spot as you know and did music on there was a guy on the piano, we went in there at like seven o'clock and place was just getting going, getting going and then yeah, he's apologizing last call nine thirty, everyone out for ten o'clock. You're like It's unreal, isn't it? Saturday night in New York. I know. And, 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 and let's be honest about it. You've seen it. You were there, Michael. The lads are genuinely doing that to keep people in work. Mm. I've known Michael since I got here, Macker. And I know for a fact that I know he would, I'd say, it, I know he's paying out of his own pocket for people. And that's the nature of the person. And he's not the only one. I know other people are just made that way too. Like, them lads could easily close that door in that place, have kept the PPP loan, and then try to do it and stuff like that. But they've, They've had people that just try and, but as Michael says, you've been in there in a month on it, like, and 10 people. And then you've like, then you've people bitching, like, you know what I mean? They're getting phone calls. Oh, this person was over at my table and this staff are going around with masks and they're trying everything. Like at this stage, I don't know. They're providing a service. I don't care what anyone says. As, it's not like they're getting a leg up. It's like, you know, it's not like, like there's other bars that have got massive fines because they broke some rules and stuff like that. But like, it's not like a man was trying to get ahead, like and make a, make a million dollars in a year. 
if he's staying open, he's doing something. Now, I'm not talking about bars that are doing it underground. I'm talking about bars that are staying open that little bit later, maybe Michael F10, or what wasn't generally happening in a lot of places. They were getting to go drinks and the people were lighter and outside. And then you have a governor who put a governing body in place to go around and find these people. Like, how do you, well, like, what, you're having a laugh here, like, you know what I mean? Just shut them down completely and then save the man that, that 15 grand we're talking about here. Some bars getting fines of 15,000. Like, how, do, how are they supposed to survive on that? Why, Santi, why, Birani? And that's all for this week. Let us know what you think by leaving us a comment on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at the Long Haul Podcast. The latest travel advice is up on the Irish Consulate's website or on their Twitter handle at Ireland in NY, while Lark and Shannon can be contacted for US visa inquiries via email on Larkin at LarkinShannonLaw.com. We also did a full visa podcast episode with Larkin a couple of weeks ago where we went through the full range of visa options open to Irish people looking to come to the US. So be sure to check that one out. And please like, rate and subscribe to the podcast. This will ensure that we can get more podcasts to you more often. New York girls, can you dance the polka? And when we got to Bleecker Street, we stopped at 44. Our mother and her sisters there to meet her at the door to me away. You Santi, boy, dear Annie. Oh, you New York girls, can you dance the polka to me way? Santi, boy, dear Annie. Oh, you New York girls, can you dance the polka?